chapter 4, which is resistance. Chapter 4, resistance. We have a whole chapter dedicated here to the uh, property of resistance. One of the things that I want you to keep in mind as we go through these chapters, especially the fundamental concepts, is that there are four properties that you as technicians need to fully be aware of. And those four properties are voltage, current, resistance, and power. And if you know everything you possibly could know about those four properties and how they're interacting in individual components, um, you're going to do very, very well in this industry. So this is one of the, as I call it, the big four. We talked about voltage and current already. This is a whole chapter dedicated to the property of resistance. After explaining and completing this chapter, you're going to be able to define resistance and explain its effect in a circuit. Determine the tolerance range of a resistor. Identify a carbon composition wire wound, and film resistors. Identify potentiometers and rheostats. Describe how a variable resistor operates. Decode a resistor's value using the color code or alphanumeric value. Identify the three types of resistor circuits and calculate out total resistance in series parallel and series parallel circuits or as I call them, complex circuits that contain both series and parallel components at the same time. The property of resistance is the opposition to electron flow in a circuit. So when current encounters opposition, we call that opposition resistance. It's going to be expressed by the symbol capital R. It's going to be measured in ohms and abbreviated with the Greek symbol omega. It's going to vary from material to material, meaning silver is the best, meaning it has the least amount of resistance. Copper is the most common, meaning that copper is the cheapest material that has the least amount of resistance. And gold makes the list because it doesn't tarnish. When copper and silver tarnish, they oxidize, and that oxide layer is a high level of resistance, which isn't good to a circuit. So that's how these three make the list. Resistance is affected by temperature. When the temperature changes, the value of resistance is going to change. So there's a direct relationship between temperature and resistance. Resistance is also affected by size or the diameter of the conductor. Basically, the thicker the diameter is, the less resistance there is because the more conducting material that there is. So this is why you always want to use the highest, the thickest wire that you possibly can afford for a project. The only exception of this would be like uh, Boeing with airplanes. They have to use the thickest wire to do the job, but they don't want to carry additional weight with them on the airplane. So they've got to really choose wisely. Generally speaking, most of the time we utilize the electrical code in establishing what gauge wire is appropriate for doing the job. In household electrical wiring, you will use 14 gauge wire for 15 amp circuits, and you'll use 20, excuse me, 12 gauge wire for 20 amp circuits. So if you go to the Home Depot or Lowe's and you look in your electrical department, you're going to find a whole lot of 12 gauge and 14 gauge wire for household electrical because that's the standard for household circuits, either 15 amps or 20 amps. Resistivity is the resistance of a material to current flow. Resistivity is different for different materials. Even good conductors have different levels of resistivity. This table here, figure 4 and 1, shows us resistivity table. And as you see, resistivity is established 
by using silver, which is the best natural conductor that we find on the periodic table, and giving it a resistivity of 1.0000. So we're using that as a benchmark, if you will. Okay? So silver is 1.0, copper 1.0625, Let's jump down to gold, 1.5. Aluminum, 1.6875. So this is not resistance, this is resistivity. It's a, it's a relative value, comparing everything to the best property, the best conductor that we have in a natural state. In science, we use a lot of values like that. One thing in particular, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of specific gravity before. Like if you test a lead acid battery with, with uh, uh, an instrument, it's like a, almost looks like a turkey baster. What you're checking is specific gravity. And specific gravity is the unit that we use in, in, in measuring values, and it compares everything to the gravity, the weight, of water, pure water, H2O, at a specified temperature. So that's an example. This resistivity measures everything and compares everything to silver, which is the best conductor known to man. Another property that you may or may not see is conductance. Conductance. Conductance is the ability of a material to pass electrons pass electrons. Resistance is the ability to oppose the flow of electrons. Conductance is the ability to pass the electrons. We express it with the capital letter G. The unit that we use is known as a MO, M-H-O, which is Ohm spelled backwards. And it's abbreviated with the inverted Greek symbol omega. This is a, uh, it, I, we don't have a font that does this, so the computer gives us this. But it's basically an upside down omega, upside down horseshoe. It's real simple how it's derived. In order for us to calculate out conductance, G, we simply take 1 over the value of resistance. The guy that came up with this was, uh, was Seaman. Have you heard of Siemens Corporation? He was the original founding father, if you will, of Siemens Corporation. And what he wanted, it was kind of in a, um, in a political battle, if you will, a personal battle with Ohm. So Ohm said, we will measure everything in resistance. And Seaman said, we will measure everything in conductance. You know, and Ohm said, you know, we're going to call resistance and measure it in the ohm. And everything is going to be measured in ohms. And semen was like, we will measure everything in Siemens, and it will be the reciprocal of the ohm. Well, who won that battle? Ohm, because we have an instrument called an ohm meter. I used to put out in class that you will never see a conductivity meter until I was corrected by a student that worked at a water treatment facility. And they do have conductivity meters that they use in water treatment in laboratories. And what that does is measures the conductivity of water. Pure water does not conduct electricity. But if you add minerals and impurities in it, it begins to conduct. So it is a scientific lab instrument. So if you were to do an Internet search for conductivity meters, you would find it. But as far as an electrical, we really don't use Conductivity is a standard. It's resistance. At millimeters, or more likely because it's the reciprocal of resistance, it would be millimoles or micromoles. Good question. Now, sometimes we have the property of resistance and we don't want it. Because one of the things I want all of you to clearly understand at this point is Everything has resistance. Everything. There is nothing that doesn't have, well, there, the only thing that does not have resistance is what's called a superconductor. And that only exists in a laboratory. Okay? And it, it only exists at extremely cold temperatures. And they're trying to develop superconductors so they can work at room temperatures. And it's going to totally revolutionize the electrical distribution industry. But right now, everything has resistance. Silver has the least 
but everything has resistance. So if you go out and buy an extension cord, it's going to have resistance because everything has resistance. That's unwanted resistance. We really want to do away with resistance in speaker wire and extension cords and jumper cables and high tension wires that connect you to the power grid, but they haven't learned how to make that go away yet. Sometimes we want to use resistance in a circuit to help limit the flow of current or also to create a voltage drop. When current encounters a resistor, it develops a difference in potential across that resistor. Now, you all remember from your previous studies, the difference in potential is what we call what? Voltage. So resistors help us create special voltages at certain parts of the circuit. So the resistor is designed specifically to be manufactured to possess a specific value of resistance to the flow of current. They're designed to have resistance built in. They come in two classifications, that of either being a fixed resistor, a fixed value, or it could be a variable value. Fixed is what you see is what you get. It's a constant value. Variable could be adjusted to suit your individual needs. An easy example of a variable resistor is the volume control on an amplifier. When you want to listen to louder music, you turn that variable resistor. That brings about a change in circuit conditions, and the music gets louder. Sometimes these variable resistors are also located inside the chassis of a piece of electronic equipment, and it requires a qualified technician to go in and make subtle adjustments to calibrate the instrument. Generally speaking, they come in a variety of shapes, sizes to meet specific circuit, space, and operating requirements. One of the things that you need to understand is that all of these components, all of these components, as precise as they are and as precise as electronics is, will have associated with them an electrical tolerance. This is the amount that the resistor may vary and still be acceptable. Basically, everything we have that's manufactured has tolerances. When you go get a gallon of gas, some place may give you a little bit more, some place may give you a little bit less. It has to be certified by the state weight and met Bureau of Weight and Measures to make sure that they're not stealing from you or not giving you. But you, you understand what I'm saying? It's going to be a little bit more, a little bit less because everything has tolerances, everything. There's nothing we can make that's perfect. The larger the tolerance, the cheaper it is to manufacture. Well, that goes without saying. So look at this. Isn't this crazy? Resistors are available with tolerances of 20%, 10%, 5, 2, 1. Let me read that again. 20%? How would you feel if you stopped today on the way home from school and you got a gallon of gas and it was plus or minus 20%? If it was plus, it would be okay. If it was minus, right? What about your uh, paycheck? You go to work for your employer and they give you your paycheck. Yeah, plus or minus 20%. It would. Well, if it was plus, it would be great. If it was minus, it would be like, this is crazy. Okay? But yet in electronics, typically a lot of components that are used are plus or minus 20%. When you order a brand new part, you get a component that's plus or minus 20%. A lot of these components, believe it or not, are used in consumer electronic products. So you spend, you save your hard-earned money and go out and buy a new surround sound amplifier for your home theater, and it sounds really good, but it was manufactured with components that are plus or minus 20%. Um, it means that it is not going to operate exactly as it was designed on paper. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to sound good, but it's not going to behave acoustically the way it was designed on paper. Yep. Computers may be a little bit tighter tolerance, but a lot of consumer electronics, I mean, and I, don't, I can't quote you the exact values, but even if you go buy a plasma screen TV, if all three of you just bought three of the same model plasma screen TVs, 
there's going to be tolerances with all of those. And actually, that's a very big niche market right now for technicians is calibrating, performing a color calibration, because your reds, greens, and blues are going to look a little bit different than your reds, greens, blues. So if you lined all three of them up, and any time you ever go like to Costco or, or a TV, you can look at the images are different colors. Yep. It is, and so, so that's one of the things that they can't adjust. With variable resistors, and a lot of it's done electronically now, but to calibrate and compensate so everything is the same. So this is the same thing, too, even a lot of music enthusiasts. When a, an artist records music in a studio, that that equipment and how the engineer listens to the music and makes the adjustments are based on the tolerances in the quality of the equipment. This is where a lot of people that are really into music, I mean like really out there, okay, like if you're like into Pink Floyd, you find which album was mixed at what particular recording studio, what speakers were in that studio, so when it was mixed down, how was it intended to be heard? When you listen to it on your car stereo, it's going to sound totally different than it was originally intended to be heard because of the mixing process and the electronic equipment that it went through. I don't need that. Just listening to it sounds good, clear, it's good enough for me. But there are people that are really into that. Same thing in the television industry. The television industry now, we use a lot of flat screen TVs and everything. If you went to a, uh, like, Como TV, their monitors... Are, are about, uh, you know, yay big that they look at, okay? They're not that big, but they're extremely deep. That's because they still use picture tubes. And those really deep picture tubes, they have much better control over the quality of the color. So when they're looking at it, like a, the, the stuff that they do the news on, and they want to adjust for the particular colors to make it look quality for broadcast, that's how they calibrate it. And then you go to Costco and buy a flat screen TV and you look, oh, the color of blue looks awful. Why do they use that? Well, it probably didn't look awful when the camera looked at it and they made the adjustments, you know, for the broadcast. A lot of that, though, is just, like I say, tolerances with components. So, oh, yeah, cars, anything. Cars, automobile, uh, are you talking car radios and such? Are you talking car computers? Car computer is the same thing. It's going to have some, there's going to be a range, and I can't quote exactly what the tolerances are. Most automotive electronics are going to have some tighter tolerances associated with them because they kind of have to work accurately to pass emissions. And I don't know if any of you even realized the last time you took a vehicle in for emissions testing, they don't even, unless you're on an older car, they don't even sniff your exhaust anymore. All that they do is plug a computer in and look at your computer to make sure your computer is operating the way it was when it left the factory. If it is, that's good enough for the environmental people to say your car is functioning okay. So in order to get it to operate, you have to use some tighter tolerance components. So I've actually worked in industry on electronic equipment that every component, every component met acceptability standards. But when it was all put together into a circuit, the circuit wouldn't work. Because over here you've got a couple components that are real high in tolerance, over here real low. And, um, but you put it all together, and I ended up spending like two and a half days trying to troubleshoot this board. And I finally went to my boss, and I said, you know, I've been spending like two and a half days with it. And he got the board, he threw it in the garbage can. He said, it should, it should take you no more than 30 minutes to work on that board. He says, the company's losing money. You know, it's cheaper to make that board than it is to pay and have you. So for me, I was intrigued because how does everything work, but yet it, when it's put together, it doesn't work. So occasionally you may see that with tolerances. It's rare, but it does occur. Some of the different types of resistors that are manufactured, one type is the molded carbon resistor. This is really the most carbon, yeah, the most carbon, it is, because it's carbon molded. Um, it's the most common resistor commonly used. The reason for this is it's very inexpensive, and it's manufactured in standard resistor values. What that means, it comes in standard sizes, just like shoes, right? You go get shoes, they come in standard sizes. So you can't, if you want to find a resistor that is exactly 33.28 ohms, they're not going to manufacture one like that. Okay, you're going to have to find a 30 ohm resistor that maybe is plus or minus on its tolerance and find the one that's closest. But they just come in standard values. 
Another type of resistor that's very common is called the wire wound resistor. This is used in high current circuits. Anybody want to take a guess at what this is manufactured out of? Wire. <laughs> Very good, wire. Uh, it's called a wire wound resistor because it's made of wire that is wound. Um, it's used in high current circuits. The resistance varies from a fraction of an ohm to several thousand ohms. Mm -hmm. Nichrome, yeah, yeah, and it's and the reason for this is because it's so predictable when you have a particular gauge of wire and you know the length of it, you can calculate out very accurately what that resistance is going to be. So when they're winding it, they could say, ah, let's just give it one more turn and we'll make it exactly 100.00 ohms. So these are precision resistors a lot of the time. The only thing I want to warn you about is, um, what do you call that when you get wire and you wind it? A coil. Very good. Um, we haven't studied coils yet, but when you get wire and wind it into a coil, it's a different type of electronic component. So I want you to be careful that if, I don't want you to be engineers. If it didn't have a wire wound resistor in it, don't say, oh, I'm going to make the circuit better. I'm going to go to my home stereo, which has 20% tolerance component, to put a wire wound resistor in it in place of that. Because that wire wound resistor may start to act like a coil in the circuit where it doesn't belong. So just be careful. If it's a wire wound resistor that was in the circuit originally, go ahead and replace it with a wire wound. If not, don't get creative. Okay? Film resistors are becoming increasingly popular. There's three types, carbon film, metal film, and tin oxide film. And what they do is they lay down literally a thin film layer of these materials. And um, it's just the manufacturing process is different. And it's what we use to create what is called a film resistor. Most of our resistors, um, our newer type resistors that are out, like surface mount resistors, utilize this film manufacturing process. Surface mount resistors are ideal for small circuit applications. They're available in both thick and thin film designs. If you were to, I don't recommend you do this, but if you were to open up your uh, cell phone, you would find these surface mount resistors in it. They're extremely tiny. If you had a package of them and sneezed, you wouldn't have any resistors left because they'd, they'd go everywhere and you're, you'd never find them in the carpet because they're tiny. Variable resistors are resistors that allow the resistance to vary. To vary. There's two types of variable resistors that are out there. There is a linear and a logarithmic type. A linear and a logarithmic type. Does everybody know what I mean when I say linear? I'm holding a yardstick. Is it a yardstick or a meter stick? This is a yardstick. Is this linear? Yeah, it is. A yard is 36 inches, so halfway is going to be 18, right? So this is linear. It's a straight line. If this is linear, what's logarithmic? Logarithmic is a progression that's based on a curve. It's nonlinear. This is linear. Logarithmic would be a curve. Do any of you have any ideas why we would want to have a logarithmic control? It really doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, if I had a small resistor that I was using in my automobile so that when I stepped on the accelerator, this is zero, this is full throttle, this is half throttle, would I want, would I want my throttle response in a car to be linear or logarithmic? I want it to be linear. I mean, logarithmic on a curve, that wouldn't make much sense. Does anybody know why we would have to use anything on a curve? Uh, 
I'll let you in on it, okay? Audio. Audio. Um, I'm not sure. This should be linear, I believe. Linear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The reason that we need the logarithmic is because audio, which is measured in decibels, have you heard of decibels before? That's a logarithmic progression. Basically, if I talk at this level right now, and then I want you to talk twice as loud, it's going to take a lot more than twice the energy for me to talk twice as loud. If any of you have ever had a shout in a noisy place or whatever you know, it takes a lot of energy, a lot more energy. So audio energy is based on a logarithmic curve. So if we want to control the volume of a stereo amplifier, variable resistors are resistors that allow the resistance to vary. To vary. There's two types of variable resistors that are out there. There is a linear and a logarithmic type. A linear and a logarithmic type. Does everybody know what I mean when I say linear? I'm holding a yardstick. Is it a yardstick or a meter stick? This is a yardstick. Is this linear? Yeah, it is. A yard is 36 inches, so halfway is going to be 18, right? So this is linear. It's a straight line. If this is linear, what's logarithmic? Logarithmic is a progression that's based on a curve. It's nonlinear. This is linear. Logarithmic would be a curve. Do any of you have any ideas why we would want to have a logarithmic control? It really doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, if I had a small resistor that I was using in my automobile so that when I stepped on the accelerator, this is zero, this is full throttle, this is half throttle, would I want, would I want my throttle response in a car to be linear or logarithmic? I'd want it to be linear. I mean, logarithmic on a curve, that wouldn't make much sense. Does anybody know why we would have to use anything on a curve? I'll let you in on it, okay? Audio. Audio. Um, I'm not sure. This should be linear, I believe. Linear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The reason that we need the logarithmic is because audio, which is measured in decibels, have you heard of decibels before? That's a logarithmic progression. Basically, if I talk at this level right now, and then I want you to talk twice as loud, it's going to take a lot more than twice the energy for me to talk twice as loud. If any of you have ever had a shout in a noisy place or whatever you know, it takes a lot of energy, a lot more energy. So audio energy is based on a logarithmic curve. So if we want to control the volume of a stereo amplifier,